Next, we have with us Ron Aiken. He's an award-winning investigative journalist whose work, whose work has appeared in newspapers, magazines, and online for the past 15 years. His writing has been recognized by state and national press associations and featured in a book celebrating the best in journalism. He's been the editor of newspapers in South Carolina, Colorado, Wyoming, and locally has been a staff writer for the state, Free Times, Columbia Business Monthly, and Gamecock Central. He came to the nerve after a year in television at WLTX. We're happy to have you with us today. Thank you so much, Ron Aiken. Hey, thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, good. First off, thank you guys for having me so much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, Diane, thank you for the invitation. Uh, happy to talk about uh, a happy subject, the, the death of journalism. Um, but uh, actually, not, not that bad. It's just, it's just changed. Um, I'm in year, I think, 17 uh, as, as a journalist. I've been in print. I've been in online. I've been in, at the comfortable sort of, uh, uh, sort of Eden of magazines for a while. And, uh, and now I'm back in uh, doing what I love, which is impact journalism and investigative journalism, which is really so important, almost more important now than ever, because there's no doubt that there are few investigative journalists, there are few investigative journalism stories uh, now than ever before. Uh, and that is precisely because of the dwindling scope of newspapers. Um, did anybody here see the movie Spotlight here recently? Uh, pretty good film. If you get a chance to check that out, I think it won an Academy Award. Um, just a fantastic portrayal of how at that time, I think that was uh, maybe the mid-90s, Investigative journalism teams were set up at most major newspapers, and that would be a staff of the best writers at any newspaper. You'd have three or four that would do nothing but have six months a year to work on an investigative project and really go all in on it. And so uh, when you look at what that manpower resource takes now at, at a newspaper, those people just aren't there. They don't have the time to spend. They have fewer journalists doing more stories covering a wider area, and they don't have the resources to put somebody just on an investigative news beat anymore. Those are one of the first things to go. Um, we've seen a bit of a spike in that recently where their newspapers are trying to manage resources, but frankly, since uh, about the late 1990s on, they've been dealing with the fire of, uh, that was burning in the home to get everybody out, which is how do I survive uh, the internet? I came on at the state newspaper at a time when we had uh, 30 people in just the sports section. Uh, I was doing high school sports. There were 15 writers. Um, just 15 writers for the state of South Carolina covering high schools, covering Clemson beat writer. We had covering South Carolina. We covered the NFL beat writer. We had a NASCAR beat writer. We had a golf beat writer. Uh, on the news side, um, probably four or five different people covering state government. Uh, we had a national Washington bureau person. We didn't get our, our news, our Capitol Hill stories from the AP or, or uh, any other wire. We got it from our reporter who was there. Um, the mantra at the time was we never run a, a, a story that is run in another newspaper. We get our own stories ourselves. Um, now I think the state newspaper has uh, four writers in the sports section, uh, down from 15. And they're still supposed to cover about the same amount of time. And the exact same thing has happened in the government side and in the education coverage side and certainly in the investigative side because the people that can do it have to go fill a hole every day. They still have to produce the same amount of content, but you've got fewer people doing it and their resources and time are limited. They're having to cover a lot of different things at once and the opportunity to do real insightful investigative pieces that mean change uh, that's for the better uh, are evaporating. Um, I recall uh, a conversation I had when I first was hired. This was really when the internet was not taken seriously. Um, and I was told the only thing you ever have to worry about is your byline. Uh, just what's under your byline is that's all you have to do. And that's so not the case anymore. A reporter who's going to cover a story is expected to be live tweeting it for the most case, especially in sports. And now that, that model has really migrated slowly but surely over to, uh, to the government uh, side of the house. Um, they're also expected to take pictures and tweet those immediately. You're supposed to write your story for the next day, which actually will go up this day. I mean, literally, the newspaper is yesterday's news. I mean, it kind of always has been. But now the way that the news cycle has trans, uh, translated into different media forms, it's yesterday's news, uh, which is why they have recognized that and they still put a lot of their emphasis on the website product. When I was uh, when first around trying to get stories up on the web, when the newspapers were coming to term with, what do we do with the web? What, how do we use the, the, the web versus our print product, which has been our bread and butter, our moneymaker for you know, a, a century or more? Um, 
the idea was just to write a little bit of blogs here, a little bit of news there, things that didn't fit into what you're gonna put in the paper's notebook, you add to the web, it's just kind of throwaway space. Um, and then they thought, well, just make sure if you do anything for there, you're teasing to like tomorrow's story. You know, be sure to check out tomorrow's edition where we're going to talk about, you know, what uh, at that time Lou Holtz really had to say about, uh, you know, the offense or something to that nature. Um, that's how they sort of viewed the web, and they were very slow to come around. And the mindset was, uh, as I was told, um, the Internet was not taken seriously because they said proudly, um, you know, radio was supposed to kill newspapers. You know, instant information, supposed to just kill newspapers, no more newspapers. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, television, supposed to kill newspapers, right? Immediate coverage, visual pictures, death of newspapers. They survived all that and had felt themselves in a very comfortable position where they did not have to take on the challenge of the Internet uh, seriously. And they did, when they finally decided to do it, they did it poorly. How did they do it poorly? They decided to give their content away for free. That was the model they went with originally because, again, remember, they're putting up things on, online that are just sort of throwaway pieces that they're not putting a lot of emphasis on. As time goes by, gradually, without even realizing it, you're putting more and more out there because you see the demand to get that information up there. And now, all of a sudden, you have a model where you're realizing you're putting so much content on the web for free because you're trying to get people to your website and, and understand what that's all about and trying to figure out how they work together. And now, Guess what? People don't want to be charged for something they've been getting for free. They hit a wall. It's a paywall. They hit it, and they got bounce back and feedback. And people already de uh, disappointed in the decline in revenue, the decline in coverage, uh, the decline in just quality in many, many instances, uh, then became disappointed with the fact that they were going to now have to pay for something they didn't want to have to pay for. And that, that set them back so much because as you look at the financial model of newspapers, how they had, had progressed naturally, uh, nationwide, you had seen a lot of large corporations, a lot of mega corporations, Knight Ritter, McClatchy, Gannett, uh, that have taken over a lot of the profitable newspapers in, in places like South Carolina, where the state newspaper at the time when I started there was massively profitable. It still remains profitable. It was the newspaper of record for South Carolina was how it liked to pitch itself. And they had, I think, a Sunday circulation of about 180,000 at that point, uh, over 100,000 uh, regular daily circulation, and they were very proud of those numbers. Um, that's no longer the case remotely, um, it, which is just kind of a, a sad testament to how that's gone. But they've since been sold and then sold again. And as these large corporations bought up so much of this product and you had an industry that was not facing the challenge of the Internet correctly, you saw these companies have to service a massive amount of debt from the big newspapers that weren't meeting their revenue goals. And so places like the state newspaper, even though they were profitable, their profit margins were being squeezed to service this debt of a national company headquartered someplace else that had no desire about the quality of journalism here other than to pay the mounting bills they had. And of course, Knight Ritter folded and, and went under, and then McClatchy came in and bought them, and they're still squeezing. They just, you know, they're, every couple, about a year and a half, they'll, uh, they'll have a round of layoffs, and more and more of the experienced people go because they have, what, the highest salaries in the room, right? And so the, the highest salary people go out, they hire new, younger people that come in, and the quality overall goes down, and the public kind of senses it, but really doesn't know it as much as people that are inside. They're like, man, they, that was, a, people don't realize what the loss just happened. When I started, I mentioned there were 15 writers. Five of them had 30 years or more experience. Um, you don't see that anymore, because again, those people have the highest salaries, uh, and they're usually the first to go. They're older employees, and, uh, and there's that whole thing. And so what happens to investigative journalism? Uh, for the most part, it fell off. Um, as the internet slowly kind of built up, it, it faced a credibility issue for internet reporting. Um, it faces that less today than it ever has before uh, because you've seen a migration of good journalists to other outlets. Um, and so part of my talk today is going to be about uh, new media and what does that mean? How does that look? Um, can it be trusted? Uh, yes and no. What, what's the difference between the nerve and Fitz News? Uh, and th there's a big difference. And how, but how do I know to trust it? Uh, it takes personal critical thinking skills to be able to do that because as information and reporting gets disseminated and all I need to write a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative story is this, right? That's all I need. To, for you to see it, it doesn't matter where it lives. As long as you have access to this or a computer screen, you can see it because a story is just a URL. It doesn't matter if it's on the New York Times or if it's on a WordPress site that I started last night or if it's even on my Facebook page. I can write a story that's of that caliber and you can have access to it just by one click, and the URL doesn't matter where it lives. The quality of the journalism that goes into it, it's sort of like that famous definition of you know, pornography, I know it when I see it. Journalism is kind of the same way, you know it when you see it. Uh, and so understanding what is credible, what is, you know, what is multiple sourced, 
uh, for things that makes this uh, serious allegation because the standard by which all journalism is measured is, of course, going to be whether it's accurate, fair, and, and truthful. Um, you can't uh, have a, uh, a libel suit against, uh, against the truth. That is always your best defense. And so making sure that when you print allegations and you print rumor and you editorialize in your things, like a lot of these sort of websites, one of which I mentioned, uh, traffics in, they get a lot of hits. They get a lot of uh, entertainment value sort of views until you're the, the subject of what they look at, and it's not quite so funny. Um, how long that site will be around, uh, I have some doubts because of some lawsuits that are under, underway. But the key is that if you're accurate and you're fair and you're truthful, you can print anywhere now. So the number of journalists that have the opportunity to do that kind of research, though, it has dwindled. Uh, they are sort of migrating to these other sites, like the one that I work for, which is an arm of the South Carolina Policy Council, which many of you are familiar with, uh, which back in 2010 had a kind of, I remember at the time, I was at Free Times. Uh, I was writing, covering higher education stories, writing about InnoVista, writing about the University of South Carolina, writing about a lot of things uh, state government-wide uh, as well. And our news editor at the time, Eric Ward, said he was leaving, and he was going to go over uh, to this South Carolina Policy Council, and he was going to work for this new startup website called The Nerve. And it's like, ah, that sounds like a dumb idea. You know, you're, why are you leaving a good gig here to go there? Well, I have no idea what this Nerve thing is. Who in the world is going to look at it? You know, you're taking, you know, the, basically at that time, we were the largest, and I think it might still be the largest uh, weekly newspaper in South Carolina, the Free Times is. Not many people know that. And go to a startup project that's... Are you going to be writing political stories? I mean, the idea was unclear. Over time, that idea has sort of become clear. And, uh, and for me, I'm now kind of a newsroom of one. Um, after uh, Rick Brundrett, who's a terrific reporter, uh, now he's in Greenville, so y'all had the benefit of him. And, and that's an aspect of how uh, a local newspaper in, in Greenville has decided that we need to pay attention to investigative reporting again. And they hired uh, him to do investigative reporting for them without having to cover the city council, town council, school board, hospital board, you know, uh, aviation authority, whatever, just do investigative journalism. And so that's the fun part of my job. It's, it's a little lonely. It's, I've got an office with three desks in there, and it's just me. Um, I would like some company because the amount of letters that, and people that just walk in the door uh, is pretty unbelievable for the stories that are out there. Investigative journalism is, to me, the journalism that matters most because it is directly holding to account uh, people who spend public money to the public. You don't have the opportunity to, or you, you do, but you probably don't do it. You don't watch your local uh, county council government on the, pay, you know, the local access channel. And it's the most boring watching in the world, right? And uh, it takes forever, and they go into executive session, and they never come back out. Uh, you have other things and better things to do. You're living your life. Uh, and so the reason that reporters are there is to bring you the information and give you what's most important about that and tell you what the impact's going to be. Um, and then beyond that, they're going to look at the bigger issues that are happening, like in Richland County, we're dealing with... Uh, Corruption, uh, allegations of corruption and wrongdoing and mishandling and illegal activities with a billion dollar penny tax program. Um, that I wrote a lot of the stories on the nerve uh, that broke those stories and opened up uh, a lot of that uh, information that was not publicly available before then because nobody was just reporting it. Um, the state newspaper has one reporter over there. Her name's Sarah Ellis. She's terrific. She's very young, right out of college, and this is her first job. And uh, as a county councilman told me, this is no disparaging comment towards her. She's doing the best she can. She's a cute girl. You know, she, she's, she's sweet. And that's what somebody says when they don't take you seriously. And so they call me for tips, and I get the, that kind of information because they've read the stories, and it doesn't matter that it lives on the nerve. It's because they take it seriously, they trust it, and they know that it's quality content, and they know if, I, if they tell me something, number one, I'm going to hold them uh, as a source confidential, and number two, I'm going to do something about it that matters. Because, again, when... Eric Ward said, I'm leaving to go to work for the nerve. Nobody's going to see that. Now, because of Twitter, and I'll get to that in a second, which is the huge component of how journalism has changed, now it's accessible to everybody. Because of Twitter, I remember when I went to the, uh, the Southeastern Conference uh, Media Days, I covered the Gamecocks for a few years. Don't hold that against me. Um, I will say that. I, um, I left after their last 11-win season and got to go to Florida in, uh, in January, and I watched them beat... Uh, Nebraska so, or Michigan, so that was, that was pretty fun. So I got out. I don't know what kind of foolishness they've been up to since. But at that time, I went to the Southeastern Conference Media Days. Um, this was probably maybe 2011. Uh, and uh, it's a huge room, huge auditorium, five times the size of this. It's every, you know, every coach, every, every media uh, junkie in, uh, that can get a press pass goes to this thing. And I remember standing at the back of the room and looking at all the computer screens you know, that were lined up, and every one of them almost was on Twitter or Hootsuite or TweetDeck. And I was like, this, this is important. This has changed. This is not how it was back in you know, 2000, 2001, early 2000s when I was doing it to begin with. Um, not at all. 
Uh, people had their stories up, but they were following that. And the way Twitter has changed journalism is because it has made everything accessible to where something lives. All I have to do to get your attention, it doesn't matter if you follow me or not, if you use a hashtag, if you follow a hashtag, I follow like about five different hashtags on my columns, SC tweets, I follow uh, the South Carolina State House, I follow Gamecocks, I follow anything of interest. I follow my wife to make sure she's not tweeting something that I can't retweet. Um, <laughs> and I use that. And so if anybody can tweet on there and just put hashtag Gamecocks, uh, I can put, I'll be in front of your computer screen no matter what. You don't have to follow me. And so that ability to bring information and stories to you, regardless of whether you subscribe to my newspaper, visit my website, or listen to my radio station, or, uh, or any of that nature, or tune into my television broadcast, I can get my story to you. And you can determine whether that in those 140 characters, it's extremely limiting. I've, that's a whole different realm of creativity, is being able to bring in a reader's interest in that moment um, to, that, to that space. Because the more people we follow, right, we do that because we want to get followers. And that means our regular home Twitter feed you know, sometimes goes 100 miles an hour. Uh, but the ability to do that with those hashtags is a way to frame debates and is a way to get in front of people that you normally can't get in front of. And that's what makes this sort of new media in environment uh, challenging and rewarding. Rewarding in the sense that I can have a nerve story that if you don't go to nerve, you never would have seen it. But I've got stories that are breaking now, and I'll have, I'll have I think, two more this coming week about the University of South Carolina's uh, PeopleSoft issues in their IT department uh, that has been, I'm guessing it's close to $100 million, uh, maybe... 40 of which um, is going to have to start from scratch over. Uh, that is a massive waste of, of money and resources for, for reasons that I'll get into in that reporting. But that opened up uh, a whole thing where we had our, our highest page views ever. We had our most read story ever by about uh, almost double. And that's something the NERV had never done. The NERV was here forever on their little metrics. We have a metrics meeting every, every month to kind of go over how did our numbers look. And, and when you use the Twitter effectively, they hadn't done that before. When you use those hashtags effectively, and when you write good journalism so that when somebody sees it, they think, this is, this is good, I'm going to come back, and they bookmark it, or they sign up for an email alert, or they just follow you on Twitter to make sure they don't miss anything, uh, then that, I mean, we probably tripled our numbers in the past three or four months alone uh, just by doing that effectively and by writing good journalism. But I'm a, again, as I said, I'm a newsroom of one. So I just get to kind of pick and choose. Now it's beautiful because I've got all of state government uh, to cover. That's kind of my, my sandbox to play in. So if something's going on at DSS, at, uh, at DJJ, at the Department of Transportation, which has been uh, under a lot of scrutiny here lately, how that structure works, um, whether it's Richland County, whether it is uh, the University of South Carolina or Clemson, those are all areas that I can investigate and look at things and kind of pick the best stories. And so that gives me a lot of material to write about, but it also lets a lot of material fall by the wayside that I wish I had the time and resources to devote to, especially when I get emails all the time from people in other corners of the state, upstate, Charleston, Marion County, that say, you need to look into what we have going on here, it's wrong. Um, and I agree, and, and bringing those things to the public is the most important aspect of what journalism would do. That's what that spotlight thing was all about, you know? Showing something that was being covered up effectively because they had a closed loop system of accountability and the only way that was going to happen is to produce the kind of reporting knocking on doors and doing uncomfortable interviews uh, that it takes and, and that's what matters and when you have fewer people doing it it's almost like and I use this um, this analogy because uh, it just gives you a basic idea but with roaches and I don't mean to call people that, that you know roaches in general but roaches come out and the lights go off you turn the lights on they scurry away so spotlight, sunshine, all that stuff is good for transparency and accountability and, and people acting in, in ethical and professional and uh, legal manners. Uh, when the lights are off and nobody's looking, the temptation to do that, there's a whole little uh, list of, um, that goes into like, if somebody's gonna embezzle, they have to be these conditions, right? You rationalize it and then you have availability and then all those kind of things that go into the, the little pyramid of when you, do, when you do wrong. And it's easy to see how that can happen for people, but when nobody's looking, it's much easier. And when you think you can get away with it and you do it once, it happens over and over again. The number of flashlights that are looking in these rooms in state government and in uh, local governments and in school boards, I've got a, a stack that big of contracts from Richland School District too that somebody said they're fixing the prices on these painting contracts and kicking other people out and it's illegal. I haven't had time to look at it yet. Uh, I, wish I, I wish I did, but those kind of things happen in little, especially small towns a lot. I've covered, I've been the uh, weekly, the editor actually of, uh, of two small town newspapers in rural Wyoming. So I know what that's like, and we talk about some nasty fights uh, in the school board and the, the little town council meetings when it's a town of uh, 54 people, and two of them don't like each other, and they're going at it, and their shots are fired, and uh, they're following you home from, from, the, from the council meeting. It's a, it's a little dicey, 
And, uh, and so that stuff kind of, that kind of thing happens when there's a temptation to abuse a system where you know if nobody's going to look, I can, I can just take a little bit from me. And don't I deserve it because I'm underpaid? Uh, that stuff happens. And we know that it happens. We're not, we're not, our, our eyes are open in this room. But the people that can write about it and expose it and make change happen in that way are dwindling away rapidly. And it's the, kind of a sad thing to see. And it's important that we understand that so that we know when, where we're getting news and when, when we're getting good news. And so the ability to shine those lights is more important than ever because there's more darkness to cover up because there's fewer flashlights in the room. That's the kind of bottom line on it. And uh, I wish I had two more people sitting in that office next to me where there are chairs because I could have somebody for Charleston, I could put somebody for the upstate, and that's all they get to do. Go look at the Greenville Health System. You know, write about that. Go look at uh, the Charleston, the Ports Authority, and really dig deep onto what their spending looks like. Um, I could have 100 people in, in South Carolina doing that in every local county. And, the idea of citizen reporting is more important than ever because all you have to have, again, your tool is the same tool that I have, and it's this thing. It's going to a meeting. It's tweeting about it. Live tweeting is a great way to have instant accountability. Uh, as a representative here uh, knows when, um, uh, when the, the House or the, the Senate is in session or a committee is meeting, um, people are on their phones, and they're seeing things that are being live tweeted at them or to them or, inc or uh, you know, um, incorporating them at that moment. And it, it can matter. It starts a, it starts a debate, a, a discussion, a dialogue that is instant in a way that that hasn't happened before. And so anybody can do that. Because again, as we said, if you use that hashtag or you just tweet at somebody, you're on their radar in a way that you could have never been before. You can call and leave as many voicemail messages as you want uh, to a House or, or Senate member's uh, staff office. And you might get a call back. Some are more responsive than others. Some are terrifically responsive. Um, but in that format, in that, in that moment, where something's happening, where a debate is going on on the floor, or where an important bill is being discussed in committee, you can have an instant impact and accountability and hold them accountable because you're live tweeting what happens in that room. Um, not all of us, as I said, are going to watch the public access television with the local Richland County Council meeting. Not all of us are going to watch the House and Senate in session uh, you know, on the, the state government, the state house television, which is great. It's often very entertaining viewing, uh, sometimes not. But not everybody's going to do that. You're at, a, you're at a job. You have something to do. Uh, and so. The opportunity to, to have somebody else doing that because you can have, no matter where you are, you can have TweetDeck up or Hootsuite, whichever you, you prefer, and you can watch that debate as it happens. And using those hashtags is a way to shape that debate too because it gives everybody a, like a place to go. Like with the Nerve, we started the hashtag SC Roads debate during that because it was just a place to have everybody on either side of that issue come and converse and tweet in real time as the debate on the floor, as the filibuster, all these things were happening. Uh, it was a place to come and create a space of engagement online that you can then link to whatever you want to do and do different stories. But your phone puts you on the same footing your Facebook page puts you on the same footing as any other journalist because I can put a story on my Facebook page and it can get just as much traction as anything else because eventually it just lives on a website. You click that URL and you go right to it. So Facebook, Twitter, the way that journalism is going in the future, no good journalism when you see it uh, because that's the best way to tell whether something's credible or not and, uh, and take that uh, under advisement at all times. Use your critical thinking skills but also just be open to the fact that there's nothing preventing you from holding somebody accountable. If somebody says something crazy at a meeting that you're at, you live tweet it, and it's now public record forever in a way that usually only newspapers had or a television station. And even newspapers were around because TV stations, their show goes on, it goes off. A newspaper lasts forever, they said. Of course, we know it disintegrates. But there's nothing preventing you to put the kind of reporting and the kind of news out there that you see in your towns and counties, your school boards, your county councils, your city councils, in a way that can live forever just by virtue of the new technology and the new environment that we live in. And, and hopefully, uh, I would encourage anybody to support the NERF if you get the opportunity, because I'd like to fill up those seats around me. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about journalism with you all. It's a very important subject, and uh, I'm glad that you all have me here to do that. Thank you. Thank you.